Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of CFO 4.0. As usual, I am your host, Hannah Monroe, and with me today is Edward Knighton. Now, Edward is um, has held a number of roles with different um, over the last uh, 10 years or so as a CFO, um, prominently, obviously, with Yo Sushi, which is probably the name I most recognize as a massive sushi fan, but has recently stepped down as CFO at Tamiya. Um, and currently it's exploring new opportunities. And we, we were just talking about how mentoring is a real passion of his. So um, welcome, Edward. Lovely to have you on the show. Thank you, Hannah. Very pleased to be with you. So tell us a little, obviously, I mentioned some of the organizations you've worked with previous, but tell me a little bit about your journey to CFO. You know, how did you you end up in your, you know, in those roles that I mentioned? Well, I qualified as an accountant with PwC. And at the time I got my qualification, I was very clear that I didn't want to become a one-trick pony in terms of a sector specialist. I didn't want to be in retail all my life or publishing or anything else. Um, I wanted to use the qualification as a crossroads and then dive off into different sectors and learn new things. And, you know, I am very blessed that I've managed to achieve that. And along the way, have worked in organizations which really fit with my personal interests, be it books, music, restaurants, um, whatever it might be. So I've been very lucky in that respect. And, and actually, I think at this stage of my career, that has proved to be the right choice because it means I get rung up about all sorts of opportunities and no one thinks, well, he can't do that because he's only ever done one sector. And that's an interesting point. And before, because obviously today's topic is very much talking about people. PE in particular and and the joys of being a CFO and that in in those particular types of organizations but um te- do you feel like a lot of CFOs do pigeonhole themselves like they do um focus on just one sector that they know well yes and I think that's actually uh, a, a wrong um preconception I spent the first few years of my CFO career in PLCs and I really enjoyed it I enjoyed you know, all of the contact with fund managers and with the press. And, you know, one of my most pleasurable experiences was being CFO of a book chain called Otakers, which was a kind of provincial competitor to Waterstones. And in the time I was there, the share price went up tenfold and small cap investors were very interested in the business. And I really enjoyed that. But when I came out of that, um, you know, I, I knew nothing about private equity. It seemed to me like that was a kind of walled garden that it was incredibly difficult to break into. When I got into private equity for the first time, and I found that obviously there are some differences. You're no longer dealing with the press um, and fund managers. You're dealing very much with your private equity firm and the banks. But the one common factor was communication. You know, people want the CFO to communicate very clearly what the prospects are for the company, where the um, areas of inefficiency are. And actually, that bit was common to both. So I would say it's not that impossible to move from one to the other. But clearly, once you get to my stage of life, then, you know, it would be very difficult for me to break back into PLCs as a full time CFO, because they say, well, you've been out of that um, area for 15 years. You don't know what my current, um, you know, listing rules are about and so forth. But even and even within, if we just you know categorise the different types of organisations as PLC and PE backed, but even within that, you've done quite quite a few different industries as well. So you've branched out in that way, even though you've maybe done a lot with the, the PE side. Yeah, and I think when I evaluate a job, what I'm looking for is aspects of the job which are very familiar to me, and aspects which will be a new challenge and be stimulating. So. There might be things structurally about the job which are very familiar. For example, a classic role for for an interim CFO in private equity is to bed down the business under private equity ownership, introduce weekly cash flow, new board reporting, improve the controls and so forth. Now, that might be the familiar bit, even if the sector is completely new, like pharma was to me, care homes and so forth. Yeah. So, so, okay. So this is, so we're all get really getting into the meat of the conversation, which is fabulous. So, so tell us a little bit about, um, for those CFOs that are looking to get into PE particular, particularly, and you obviously mentioned, you talked about it as being a bit of a walled garden. Um, why do you think that perception is there about it being difficult to get into PE? And, and in your experience, how valid is that feeling as it were? Well, I think, 
you know, I've really enjoyed my interactions with headhunters, but they're risk averse. They want to put a square peg into a square hole. So they want sector experience if they can, because often the chairman are saying, I'd prefer someone from my sector. Um, and they would prefer some some sense of PE experience already that you've acquired as a financial accountant, a financial controller, or an FPNA. So it may seem like it's a closed shop. How do I break in? Um, but of course, networking is really important. You know, get to know as many people as possible. Uh, get to know the headhunters before a job opportunity really turns up, and emphasize aspects of your CV. CV, which would be appealing to private equity, even if you haven't done it. And in fact, of course, you know, there is always an element of luck. And my first job in private equity um, came from an investment director, HG Capital, whom I'd worked with 10 years before when he was at 3i. And I just saw his name in the Financial Times one day. I rang him up and said, I'd like to come and see you. He said, I want to put you in this particular business, which is in trouble. I said, I don't like the look of that, but I do like the look of Boozy and Hawks, which is also in your portfolio because I know something about classical music. And he said, oh, I wouldn't trust that if I were you. It's going to be really tricky. And I said, no, I really want to try it. <laughs> and he put me in and it was one of the best jobs I've ever done. Um, so oh, wow. lots of luck involved, but you've got to back yourself at some point and say, yeah, I can feel that this fit is good for me. And I like that, you know, you, you, you know, obviously made the opportunity to maximize your network, but you were very clear with, I guess, with that person about what it is that you're interested in and what, what motivated you. Um, to step. So what was it about that particular role that sounded so exciting for you? Well, I, once I join a company and get into it, I do become a complete groupie. You know, I live and breathe the company. I'll go to all of the extracurricular events and I want to get out and around the business. And classical music is one of my uh, passions. And so to join the world's own oldest classical music publisher, where I knew that I'd know the catalogue to start with as a punter really, really well, um, I knew that was I was going to get off to a flying start. Now, when we came to exit two and a half years later, I knew, obviously, I knew that catalogue from the inside backwards. I knew what the earnings potential was of all of the individual composers. And I think that came across to the bidders that I knew the real detail, the granular detail about what the earnings prospects were going to be. And that led to, you know, it was obviously a team effort, but we got a price of 19 times EBITDA for that business, which when I joined it, had just breached its banking cover. So, you know, to, to really get it, yeah, under the skin of the business and communicate that internally and externally is vital. And do you think it's important for CFOs to have an investment in the, the services and products that the, the company that they're working with is delivering? Do you think that is that important to you personally? Is it something that CFOs should be thinking about? To be emotionally invested, you mean? Uh, emotionally or um, in, I guess interested is the is the piece do you think it's important to to be interested in what the business is producing as well as obviously the role that you're going into well I, I, I've mainly worked in B2C companies where you know you, they do pass the kind of drinks party test people have heard of where I've been working I have to say that you know, there are pluses and minuses to that. You know, finance teams in London-based B2C businesses are heavily stretched because they're low-margin businesses. If you get into a high-margin business like a music publisher or like a software business, as I recently have been in, then generally if margins are higher, then the finance team is better resourced. So I probably made life difficult for myself by being invested in B2C businesses, but I won't regret it when I, you know, finish my career because I've had a lot of fun. I, Think about, um, you know, Harry Potter Day when I was at Otterkers. Uh, I have a, this clear memory of walking down a high street in the Midlands of England and seeing a little eight-year-old girl dragging her granny physically to the bookshop saying, Granny, we've got to get to Otterkers. And then that's when I realized that we were doing a public service. You know, this product was really infusing people. And that was just the case when I was sitting in a Yo Sushi restaurant as well and seeing kids having fun there. So, yeah, I need that emotional investment, definitely. That's fabulous. So, um, obviously, you've had an emotional investment in a lot of the, the companies that you've worked with. But why PE? What, what, did, what was it that you attracted you to move into that space in the first place? Well. Of course, you know, no one's 
truthful if they don't admit that they think PE is about landing up on the beach in their mid-40s, having made so much money they can retire early. Of course, the reality is very, very different. I would say, you know, if you asked you know, the average investment director how many of the investments really met their business plan and created clear, clear equity value from start to finish, then um, it would be probably one in 10. Um, but nonetheless, that doesn't mean that there's an awful lot of fun for the finance director, even more difficult investments. And I would say what appeals to me is, unlike a PLC, where you have to go through a boardroom and you've got so many different stakeholders, really the lines of sight for a CFO and private equity are very clear. They are, you know, your, your stakeholders, your CEO and chairman, and they're your bank and your private equity firm. And so as a CFO, you've got a clear mandate for change. There aren't lots of committees you have to go through in order to get stuff done. And I've always liked that clear mandate. And I felt that my voice in the boardroom was therefore heard uh, a lot more directly than in a PLC. Yeah, absolutely. And are there any other differences that you think people should be aware of before they make that sort of that step over over the line and into PE? Well, I think you're more aware in PE about the fact that you are walking along a bit of a tightrope in communication terms. So you have two kind of, you have one reporting line to your chief executive and chairman, but you also have a kind of branch line to your private equity firm. And they will want to talk to you one to one. For example, you know, your chief executive doesn't need to know about abstruse parts of the banking agreement and the covenant structures. That is a one to one dialogue between you and the private equity firm. But you've got to observe demarcation lines. So if there is an important bit of news, for example, about a new product launch or about uh, a senior executive departing, then that, that news is for the CEO to communicate to the private equity firm. And they won't appreciate you uh, having a side channel to the private equity firm without them being aware of what communication is going on. So that is something which is a bit more tricky to manage the early in your career. You will make some mistakes about that, and it's crucial to get those demarcation lines right. And that's a that's a brilliant tip for anyone looking to to shift into that role is being aware of that balance between those two. Is there anything else that you think that those that are shifting into that you know maybe they're in the first role in PE? Anything else that people need to watch out for? I think the covenant structures are your bible. You know, the one sacking offence for a CFO in private equity is if you breach your banking covenants by mistake. You know, you suddenly do all the calculations at the end of the quarter and suddenly you thought, oh, actually, I breached. And that, you know, that can take CFOs who are inexperienced by surprise, but it shouldn't do. You know, if you really understand all of the detailed clauses in the banking agreement and you've done your covenant projections carefully, then you should be able to get advance warning of a problem. And you won't be fired if you've given everyone advance warning that there's no chance of meeting the covenant. What you will be fired for is if you haven't made every effort to do your bit in terms of managing the cash or managing the costs in order to make that breach as least likely as possible. And if you haven't communicated carefully that it's likely to happen. Absolutely. So um, keep keep an eye on the covenants, obviously a key part of um, the that CFO role. Um, and is there anything else that you, you know, like new CFOs coming into that first P role, anything else that you feel they need to be mindful of or aware of as they go in? Well, I think particularly if you come from being a financial controller, it is a mind shift to being a CFO. And when I get rung up about a new role in private equity, there's two stories I get from the headhunter. The first story is, uh, and it's about the current incumbent. And the first story will be, oh, Bob's a great guy, but you know the board thinks he's being too much of a controller. He hasn't made that leap of mindset. He's getting in his own financial controller's way. They're both up till three o'clock in the morning trying to get the numbers to tie up. And he's not thinking strategically about where the company is going. And the second story, oh, Christine has been wonderful. We love her, but she's too strategic. And this is a kind of polite way of saying that Christine is not sufficiently in touch with the numbers, has let her financial controller do all of the detail, 
But then when the chief executive is in a meeting with the bank or with the board with her, then she's always pressing, you know, you know, mentally, she's always saying, I've got to check back with my finance team. And she's not showing that she's really on top of that granular detail while at the same time seeing the strategic picture. And so coming into a role, I would say, you have to get the balance right. You must go through the books and make sure you understand your balance sheet and where the problem areas lie. But you can't spend your whole life as a CFO firefighting. You've got to see the big picture and see the whole architecture of the deal through to exit. And how do you know when you've got that balance right? Or actually, maybe if I ask it this way, how do you know that that balance isn't right? And you know, how do you self-assess in that, in that realm? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, I think if you look at your team and you see that they are up till three o'clock in the morning and they're looking stressed, then it's a very natural human instinct to say, well, it's all their problem. I'm just going to bury my head in the sand and uh, not get involved. Now, you don't want to do their jobs for them. But what I would do is take that person out of the office environment. You know, I mean, I remember during COVID going for a walk with my financial controller and just saying, Let, let's work through the problems together and then work out what your your issue is. Is it that the system's a systems issue which is creating a glitch with the numbers or is it that you don't have enough support behind you and I've got to make myself a nuisance with the chief executive and get more support for you? Or what is it? Equally well, if you're in that meeting with the, with the bank or, or the board, and you realize that they're seeing numbers not tying up and you haven't spotted it, then that's a really good sign that you're not in touch with the numbers. You've got to go back to basics and work out why you missed that. You know? Absolutely. So I guess, you know, so what we're saying here is finding that balance between um, being being in the numbers and knowing your numbers, plus having the time for that strategic focus is is, is what's really important to 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 really be living that CFO role. And I, I think that's a balance, you know, so that's not, not just a PE piece. I hear that a lot with um, with uh, CFOs from bus- all types of businesses, um, that finding that balance is super hard. Yeah, I think, you know, part of that, of course, is not always looking backwards, but also looking forward. And in my development of the board report, as my career has gone on, I've looked to find formats which enable the board to tease out the future from the chief executive and CFO rather than worrying too much about the past. And obviously, if people have confidence in the numbers, then they can rise above that and then look forward rather than backwards. I think that's a really good point because there is a danger, isn't there? If, the, if you know, as soon as somebody spots a weakness in the numbers, then that's where all of their focus goes. So and until you've got your your house in order on that side of things, it's really hard to do what is the most value adding piece of that CFO role and start looking more strategically. Absolutely. And, you know, I've sat in boards over 27 years where it gets very focused on the chief executive saying, uh, you know, look at the deals I've signed in the last quarter and wanting to, in a way, not get pressed on what future objectives and ambitions are. But actually, it makes for a much healthier board meeting if you get all of that out of the way in the report. And then, you know, just say what you're worried about, what is coming up, you know, and, and make it a more of a two way dialogue. And then that's much more enjoyable for the non-execs, for the investment directors. So, so let's talk about that because there, um, that CEO relationship. Because you said from the beginning, there's kind of two main key relationships that you need to manage as a PE CFO: the CEO and the obviously the PE house. Let's if we talk about the CEO um, role first, because that could be quite challenging, can't it? Because at one hand, you've got to be that CEO's right hand man and setting them up for success but secondly you know when the board turn around you go is this achievable are we going to hit these numbers you need to be able to, to talk openly and with integrity on uh, on the validity of the numbers that, that are being put forward so what's your perspective on that how do you manage that relationship the analogy i give you is like an electorate with a political party Actually, although it's very entertaining to see conflict between, you know, the prime minister and the chancellor, nonetheless, actually, you will only win votes if you show unity between the prime minister and the chancellor, that they're singing from the same hymn sheet. And it's the same in a company. Actually, as a young CFO, you think, oh, I can hear my chief executive always only giving the good news in the board meeting. I want to pipe up and say, actually, there's a risk area here. But... 
you won't win any credit with anybody by looking disunited. So it's much better to swallow your pride and brief the chief executive on any bad news before the board meeting and then agree together how you communicate it. And you've got to resist that passion and you know rebellious side of your nature, which is very common to CFOs where they want to hijack the whole meeting and give the bad news because they think it's the right news. Now, of course, it might turn out the chief executive is right in his optimism. And really what people want out of a CFO is to see that they're growth orientated and that if there is a problem, they'll work through it privately in between board meetings and then come up with a solution rather than with the problem. I, I love that. So, you know, the unity is the most important piece. But actually, I guess that comes down to a lot about managing your relationship with the CEO in the first place. If you've got that good enough relationship, with them that you can have those conversations and can agree a process together, then that that you know that addresses that issue in the first place. The job of CEO is extremely lonely. You know, it's it it, it, it may not seem so, but if you were actually able to do the job yourself, then yes, of course they could talk to their chairman, they could talk to you know partner at the end of the day. But there is a loneliness about being the chief executive. You had to come up with a lot of the blue sky initiatives ultimately. And the CFO does well to remember that. And, you know, one of the things I've done is when I've come out of a difficult meeting and the chief executive has done well, I just tell them. And I say, actually, I was really impressed with how you handled that. And that is quite counterintuitive. It doesn't go to your nature. You're, you know, often come out thinking, oh, you know, I didn't get my point across. But if you are a little bit counterintuitive, it really pays off. Yeah. So are there any other top tips for how how to maximize and get the most out of your relationship with your CEO? Yes, I think what a CEO likes most of all is if finance is popular with the rest of the business. They don't want it to be a pariah that's causing trouble the whole time. They wanted it knitted in. Um, And so get out from behind your spreadsheet, behind your laptop and make friends with the marketing director, the operations team. And in the multi-site business, the most fun I've had is when I've spent July and August going out on the, around the outlet to do their restaurants, book, bookshops or whatever. And the reason I've done that is because I often get my best ideas about how to improve the business by individual conversations with branch managers. And they may come up with an idea which is tiny or they think it's tiny. But I can see as CFO that if I replicated that idea across the business, it would really improve profitability. So the CEO wants finance to be integral to the whole business and not a thorn in its side. Yeah, that that's a that's a really that's a really good point. So, you know, how you approach it can when you point with the CEO. Is there anything um else that you found um you know, is there anything else that you found has really helped your relationship with the CEO? Any tips, any other tips or tricks you've got? Well, I think particularly in private equity, the CFO is supposed to be this profit center. You're supposed to be uncovering areas of inefficiency. Now, what's helped me over the last five years particularly is understanding that the best people in FP&A are data analysts rather than qualified accountants, with all due respect to the qualified accountants I've worked with in that role. But I've more recently worked with really highly um, experienced data analysts who understand that you uncover areas of inefficiency and potential improvements in profitability if you can connect different databases of information together. And I did that very successfully at uh, Sofa.com and Yosushi in particular, and found areas that the chief executive didn't know about, which did improve the gross margin. And obviously, that's a very popular thing to do for your chief executive if you have a driving um, you know, linear improvements in gross margin towards exit. Absolutely. So if we sum up those key points, so firstly is get it in and out of the business. The, the CEO wants to feel like you are as invested in the business as they are. Secondly, finding areas to focus in terms of um, improving that bottom line, improving that gross margin and finding ways to use finance to, to really add value in terms of profitability. And thirdly is to not... Uh, to set your CEO up for success with the board and with the the wider stakeholders and the PE group um, by not uh, stepping on his toes or her toes. You know, we've got to be uh, equal opportunity here. Absolutely. And, 
you know, you've got to enthuse your senior finance team to behave in the same way because they will spot things because they're more into the detail than you are. Um, and then you've got to be able to obviously harness that and get them out around the business so they can make a difference as well. Absolutely. So that's very much about the CEO relationship. What about the PE house? What have you learned over the years in terms of how how to maximize that relationship? Well, you're often dealing with three different people. Um, you will have two investment directors on your board. One might be the managing partner of the firm and then someone in sort of mid-career. And then you'll be dealing with a third person who will be a business school graduate, maybe in their late 20s, early 30s, who will be doing a lot of the detail around the covenant. So those three relationships are very different. Obviously, they talk all the time. And uh, what do they want out of you? Well, they want ultra responsiveness. You know, I think they they don't expect you to put your out of office on when you go on holiday for two weeks. And that, you know, that increasingly, I think younger CFOs are finding that difficult to marry with family life. Um, but they do expect that uh, element of responsiveness, whether it's holidays or not. And when it, you are uh, back at work, then you've got to prioritize their requests. I find you've got to just turn around everything they want ultra quickly and uh, you know, show them that they can have confidence in the cash the systems and controls and cash is number one for them because that's often the, the most difficult covenant to monitor so to them knowing that you've got that grip on the detail got the clarity around cash is really really important is there anything else that you've found over the years that has helped you build strong relationships with that pe house i think um quickly getting into the sector and spotting things that they haven't spotted. I mean, they will be doing a lot around the sector as well. They'll be looking at your competitors. They'll be helping you look for acquisition targets. And, uh, you know, so it's a two-way process. They'll be supporting the business in that way. But they can't be in the business day to day. They can't get under the skin. And they will look to the CFO to be their eyes and ears. And it, that, that come back to this question of a bit of being on a bit of a knife edge. They want you to be able to show them things about the numbers that they haven't spotted, things about the operations they haven't spotted. But it's a always question of how they communicate that. And then once you have done an acquisition, they will be all over the integration process. And, you know, the number of opportunities that have been presented to me, Hannah, where the CFO has done the acquisition but fallen down on the integration, and that's why they're being moved on, it, you know, is, is very, very common. It's, it's very easy to do the initial deal much harder then to knit that business into the fabric of the organization, work out where there are overlaps in people, where there are systems that need to be integrated and move the, the business forward as a coherent group. And I think that's a whole topic for another podcast. If you don't mind, Edward, I'm going to park that because I've, I've got so many questions just out of that one statement. Um, but we're not yes. going to get to them before the end of this podcast. So I, I might have to uh, try and convince you to come back on and talk about acquisition integration because it's a, it is, you're right, it's a really big topic and there's you know lots of ways it can go wrong. So yeah. one of the things that I did want to talk about, and you mentioned it earlier on in the conversation, right at the beginning, we talked about why people go into PE. And there's obviously this, this hope that you might end up on a beach at the age of 40 or 50 and living your, your best life. So obviously, the financial aspect um, of being a CFO in a PE world, it can seem quite attractive. But how do you, you know, we talked about um, the options, you know, things like management incentives. How do you negotiate those? Or, you know, what, what sort of things should you be looking out for? Well, I think this has always been an issue for me. And clearly, Hannah, if I was being really good at it, I would be on that beach now and not talking to you. So, but I've, I've had my, you know, I've had some good times and some bad times. And I've had times where, you know, realistically, I've probably been over rewarded. Um, either in comparison to the length of time I've been in the business or in relation to other members of the management team and other times when I've you know, done an awful lot of work and then haven't seen it through to the end of the deal. So I think the first thing is to be phlegmatic and not expect that it's all going to come right initially. And I would certainly say to a young CFO, don't turn down your first opportunity just because you don't think you're going to make any money out of it. It's a... It's a bit like running for Parliament and expecting that the first one, you might be a very diff you know, difficult constituency 
and you've just got to earn your spurs. And similarly, your first CFRO role, just concentrate on doing a good job, learning about those relationships, learning about managing the cash and the exit. And if you get the exit, even if you make no money personally, that will be great for your CV. But to come back to your question about how you negotiate your own position, it's very difficult because you now supposing you know the chief executive saying, "Great news, you got the job. We think you're wonderful for us." And here's two thousand shares at forty pence a share, and in either we won't, we'll make you pay for it, or we won't. Whatever. How do you know that that's right? Well, it's very difficult. You can first of all, I think the question is, are you being asked to commit big money? before you even see the business. And I interviewed for a situation quite recently where I was told by the headhunter, you've got to be prepared to invest a six figure sum. And that's a, that's a condition of entry before you even meet anybody. And I said, okay, well, I'll meet people and see what I think. And I went through about six or seven interviews and I saw the books and they were very open about the fact, um, you know, that I asked to see the books of the private equity firm's office and the business had already breached banking covenants once and they'd had to do a big equity cure and they didn't deny that they might breach covenants again and i said well thank you very much but i'm not going to invest a six-figure sum into a structure which is clearly not fit for purpose and won't necessarily suit trading conditions in the near future and i had to withdraw the process and i think that was the right thing to do um now in other cases um if you're near to exit if the equity is underwater then you might be offered a fixed fee, which will be taxable under income tax rules, and you'll have to live with that. And that actually suited me very well in a recent case, um, because everyone agreed that there was no value in the equity. And, and the reality, Hannah, is if I think if I could see the stats, I'd probably find out that seven or eight deals out of 10, uh, the equity does go underwater. And if whole periods are six or seven years, then a deal might go through two or three CFOs in that time. So quite often the private equity house will inherit a CFO, decide that they're not right for them. Two years in, they hire somebody else. That person lasts two or three years, but they may or may, they may, may, or may not make it through to exit and they may or may not have invested money or not. So some of it all is there's a lot of luck, but if you want to be sure of making money, then get some exit experience under your belt and make a point of, joining businesses which are clearly in the last runway, the last 18 to 24 months before exit, and then you'll almost certainly be there at the end. And um, you talk a lot about obviously preparing for an exit. Are there any top tips that you could give our listeners around that process? I would say think about the exit from the moment you enter the business. And of course, on exit, it's a selling job. So your chief executive and your chairman and your private equity house will be focused on all the good news to tell the buyer, and they'll be pressurizing you to come up with some very optimistic growth forecasts. So what do you do about that? Well, on the forecast, I'd stand your ground because actually momentum through an exit process is really important. The buyer will find out some bad things. Um, they will pick holes in your forecast. So if you can show actually that there are ways in which you can outperform as you go through that process, which may be you know, a quick three months, or it might be a very long 12 or 18 months, then that's really important. And the other thing I like to do is ahead of time, spot what I call the Achilles heels of a business, because every business has things they'd like to sweep under the carpet. And this might be a pension deficit, it might be a uncrystallized tax liability, and it's your job to do the risk management. So you need to spot that risk area really early on, and do some mitigation around it. You may not be able to box it off totally before exit, but you can bet your life that the bidder will find it, however much you try to hide it. And therefore, it's better actually to front up about the issue, uh, but then show what the solution is. And then that way, the chip that they come up with will be much lower than if they find it by surprise on the 11th hour of the 11th day just before the deal. Absolutely. There's, you, know, you don't want any surprises through that process and never, never a good thing. And it, it brings brings doubt into the conversation, which is, is, is not great. As you say, momentum is key. No, particularly if it's a surprise to the private equity house, but the management team knew about it. That's the worst situation to be in. Mm. So it's better to be open with everyone and say, I'm worried about this. I do think it will be the focus when we come to exit. 
can you help me in terms of mitigating the issue? Absolutely. Um, and, uh, you know, this conversation has been so interesting, Edward. So firstly, thank you so much for coming in um, and uh, taking the time to to talk us through. Um, and uh, I, I, I've still got a few questions to go, but I'm very aware that we're running roughly out of time. So, so for those that are either considering PE or are looking to get their their first job in PE, or perhaps have got it and are thinking, right, where do I, where do I start? What do I do? What are your sort of top recommendations for how to be a successful CFO in PE? Well, the first thing in terms of getting the job is I hammer LinkedIn. I really use it. I make lots of connections. You know, I do things like this, you know, getting out and talking about what you're doing, uh, you know, doing a little post, it might be something in your personal life, whatever, it's just it triggers people's mental databases. Um, at the start of COVID, I did a little post about my son who qualified as a junior doctor. And that one post got about, you know, 150,000 views and 4,000 likes. And it put me back in people's minds. So be visible is my first tip. Whether you're in the job, communicate, 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 you know, always look to find new areas of inefficiency, new opportunities for the business and be part and parcel of the fabric of the business and live and breathe it. And then it is the most exhilarating environment to be in when things are going well. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Edward, for joining me on the podcast. I'm sure our listeners will have lots of questions. So guys, do remember this is a two way street. So I have the I have the fun job of getting to ask the questions, but I love inspiration. So if there's questions you think I should have asked Edward or questions you want us to answer on a future podcast, then please do reach out to me. You can DM me on LinkedIn or reach out um, via email all of the links are in the show notes as well. So I want to say a massive thank you, Edward. It's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you for sharing your knowledge and, you know, all of your experience that you've gained over the, you know, the last 10 to 15 years. It's been really, really interesting. It's been great to get your perspective on, on particularly the PE side of things. Thanks, Anna. I've really enjoyed chatting to you. So, um, so guys, thank you. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please do not forget to leave us a review. Let, um, let me know what, what you've enjoyed as well, because again, we want this podcast to be something that you, you tune into each week. So take care guys. And I will speak to you soon.